Right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining joining us. Welcome to the Eisenhower Presidential Library. My name is Joy Murphy. I am the Director of Learning and Engagement. Thank you all for joining us to get today for our Lunch and Learn. We are pleased to welcome Dr. Jack Hall, who will be talking to us about uh, Eisenhower and the flu pandemic. So I do not wish to prolong your time. So welcome, Dr. Hall, and please tell us a little bit about yourself uh, before you begin. Hello, this is Jack Hall. Thank you, Joy, uh, very much for the invitation to come here. It's good to be out of the house, uh, up here in Abilene. Uh, I'm conducting some research on a project I'm working on, on, on Ike, and uh, uh, I'm really blessed. I, my my son-in-law, Dr. Thad Gillespie, has come all this way to help me, and uh, it's been a it's been a joy to be up here working at the library. Uh, I first came here in I think 1975, and uh, have published two books about Ike. One with Richard Hewlett entitled Adams for War and Peace, which was volume three of the AEC history. And then subsequently I published last year with Erdman's Press, uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower's Religious Journey. Uh, and I'm now currently working on a project relative to Eisenhower's painting. Joy has asked me to share with you uh, some of the work that I have done on Eisenhower and the uh, epidemic, the flu epidemic uh, or pandemic of 1918 uh, with emphasis on his leadership development. Um, it was in the spring of 1918 that Eisenhower was placed in command of the tank corps at Camp Colt, Gettysburg. Camp Colt was the Army's tank training center at that time. And it was a significant appointment, really, and an important one, an assignment that I think uh, was uh, vital for uh, uh, re really getting his career started in, in, in a, an important way. Uh, I think the Camp Colt assignment may have been uh, Eisenhower's largest personal command. Now, I, I don't know that for sure. Uh, perhaps he had a larger command at Fort Lewis later. Uh, I don't know. I mean, maybe one of you can help me uh, on the numbers there, but he had under his command at Camp Colt when it was all over, about uh, 10,600 men. During the pandemic of uh, 1918, he lost 175 uh, soldiers to the pandemic. Uh, and yet at the same time of, of this loss, he also gained distinction and praise for his management of the pandemic. So what I wanna do this afternoon is to uh, offer my thoughts about this matter in, in, in three steps. First of all, I wanna offer a general summary of the pandemic of 1918. I think that's a need to start there. Secondly, I wanna make some general remarks about Eisenhower's leadership. Uh, and then thirdly, uh, I want to bring then the two topics together, the pandemic of 18 and, and, and his leadership. So uh, let me begin with a few comments about the pandemic of 1918. Uh, it was the deadliest pandemic 
of the 20th century. Uh, excellent books, I think, to uh, look at in this respect are Albert Marin's very, very, very dreadful, the influenza pandemic of 1918, published by Knopf in 2015. This is a, a super book uh, for any level, particularly high school, I think even grade school. John M. Barry's The Great Influenza, the epic story of the deadliest plague in history, published by Viking in 2004, is probably uh, the most academic, uh, the most technical, and is also an excellent, excellent source for the pandemic of 1918. Uh, also, I've learned that Marilyn Holt is working on a study of the 1918 pandemic. And so that, that probably will be very interesting to see. The pandemic uh, lasted about 10 months from February of 1918 uh, through November, 1918, with the worst month of the pandemic being in October. And with the H, one N1 virus, worldwide about 500 million people were infected. About one third of the world's population has been estimated. Of that 500 million, there were an estimated 50 million deaths worldwide. Now these numbers uh, vary depend upon the sources. I think the truth of the matter is nobody really knows how many people were infected or how many people really died. But, but these numbers, 500 million sick, 50 million dead are uh, just, uh, numbers that I think folk, most folks go about. In the United States, we had about 105 million population. And out of that population, 28% became ill, that's almost uh, 30 million. Uh, and about 675,000 Americans died from the in influenza, 675. And it impacted mostly babies uh, up to uh, five years old, the elderly over 65, and the young between the ages of about 20 and 40. Uh, 675,000 uh, Americans, 675,000 Americans died from the influenza. Uh, pandemic. Uh, this 675,000 who died is more than all the servicemen who have been killed in combat in American wars. This includes the Indian wars and, and pirates and embassies as well as Spanish-American war and the Civil War and the World Wars. That is to say, more Americans died of the pandemic than have died in battle since 1776. And if you combine the pandemic of 1918 with the current COVID pandemic, the number of American deaths in those two pandemics exceed the number of deaths of servicemen since 1976 for all reasons, combat, accidents, illness, or other service-related re service deaths. So the two pandemics of the 20th and 21st century together are more than all, all of the servicemen we've lost and, and women for any reason since 1976, uh, since, excuse me, since 1776. The flu of 1918 swept around the world in four waves. 
uh, and these waves hit every continent except, seriously, except South America and Central Asia. But it did include Australia and New Zealand. Uh, what was unique about the 1918 pandemic was that it was exceptionally deadly for the healthy, for young folks between the ages of 18 or 20 and 35 to 40 uh, seemed particularly uh, susceptible uh, for, uh, and, and, and were the ones who, who died uh, the most. This is a pandemic, of course, for which there were no vaccines or antibiotics. Antibiotics Interventions uh, are familiar to you all, and, and they were largely limited to isolation, distancing, quarantine, personal hygiene, disinfectants, and limited public gatherings. This, this sounds familiar. Uh, and of course, uh, these were unevenly applied across the country and, and across the world and often ineffective. And the pandemic of 1918 also, you're not gonna be surprised, inspired a rash of medicines, elixirs, and potions, uh, all of them, uh, or most of them, I suspect, unaffected. Uh, that's what I want to say in general about the great pandemic. My comments about Eisenhower's leadership next, I want to say that uh, I think today it's easier to talk about leadership than it is to talk about politics, religion, science, the weather, or even having babies. Uh, central to your discussion, of course, in this series, is the question is, what is leadership? And it's a difficult concept, I think, to define in any, in any definitive way. Uh, I think leadership is largely situational. It's profoundly cultural. It's often subjective. In other words, there are different kinds of leadership for different purposes. And I don't know how y'all think of it, but I tend to think of leadership in professional terms, such as nursing or teaching or the legal profession or even sports or occupational leadership, which would be like sales, marketing, firefighting, farming perhaps, or personnel leadership. That is to say boss, supervisor, manager, or, or coach. Uh, I, in fact, when I was working for the government, uh, I was uh, served uh, for some time as chief historian of the Department of Energy, was sent to leadership school at uh, the Merchant Marine Academy in Kingston, New York. And of course, there, leadership for the federal government meant leadership in the civil service. And so we learned a lot about how to manage, uh, how, how to supervise, super. Uh, 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 civilian uh, personnel. Uh, and I found to my surprise, actually, when I went to this leadership school at Kingston, that I learned a lot. Uh, there was a lot to learn, partic particularly about listening, active listening. But I also learned when I well, later took a job as an associate dean at Kansas State University, 
that what was considered important, effective leadership from the perspective of the civil service didn't work in the academic community. Now, I mean, who's surprised about that? But it was, uh, it was a big learning experience for me in terms of understanding and getting the, the idea of, 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 the, of the varieties of leadership and, and the difficulty of really pinning down what we mean by that. But I do think, and what I want to offer here before we get to Camp Colt, is some thoughts I have about the general leadership principles of, of General Eisenhower. And one of the first ideas that I was introduced to in this regard has to do with hidden hand leadership. And I, I suspect most of you know about Fred Greenstein's book, The Hidden Hand Presidency, Eisenhower as a leader. And uh, I have no argument with, with, with Fred's book. It was a great book and, uh, and uh, insightful and it's been a guide uh, to my own scholarship. But I had a sense at the time when Fred Greenstein's book came out that one of the things that Fred was surprised about in his hidden hand leadership theory was that there was any leadership at all. Uh, and as I listened to him, I, at that time, I was working on uh, Eisenhower's atomic energy policy. Uh, and I was thinking about the silver lecture at Columbia and about the chance for speech, peace speech and the Adams for Peace speech and the amendment of the Atomic Energy Act of 54 and the bi, uh, bilateral agreements negotiated, the establishment of the IAEA and so on forth. And I said, you know, this isn't hidden handed. Uh, this is right up front. Uh, I, in fact, talks a lot about this. Uh, so that yes, I agree that Ike was a hidden handed leader but he wasn't just the hidden handed leader. And, and my thought came to mind was, uh, was the book that my, a good friend of mine, uh, James McGregor Burns wrote about FDR, the lion and the fox. And FDR of course was a lion and FDR was a fox. And I thought, well, you know, Ike was kind of a lion and a fox. Oh my gosh, so though, you know, who would want me to, even Ike would despair if I compared his leadership to Ike, uh, to, to Roosevelt. But also a leader that's a characteristic of this sort of lion and fox or hidden handed, open handed was Abraham Lincoln. And I think, you know, the way Lincoln led, the way he, he delegated responsibility was a way in which Eisenhower himself uh, would, would lead. And in fact, I ultimately came to believe, I don't know whether any, anybody would agree with me, that the president Eisenhower admired the most in terms of leadership was Lincoln. Uh, and I think that's manifest in fact that you know, he painted Lincoln a lot, and uh, his first, first Christmas card was Abraham Lincoln. And I think Ike truly wanted uh, Americans, when they think, thought about Ike, to think about Lincoln, when they thought about Lincoln, to think about Ike, frankly. And uh, the, the two of them had, I think, similar styles, if we could use the, the shortcut of hidden hand and, and, and maybe uh, open hand. Uh, there's another way of looking at Eisenhower's leadership too, which I, I think is important. Uh, and that's uh, the argument that, uh, that uh, says that uh, uh, 
uh, we want to look at what Eisenhower does, not so much perhaps what he says. And a leader in, in this uh, approach has been David Nichols in a matter of justice uh, uh, about uh, Ike on civil rights, but also on his, his book on McCarthy and, and, the, and the Middle East. Uh, uh, and I think Nichols' uh, uh, per perspective in, in this respect is pretty important, uh, and and it's one it's it's one that I I have, have followed uh, as as well. I have argued in the uh, book on Eisenhower's religion that one of his leadership thoughts and leadership principles was that he wanted to be a religious leader to the American people. Now, uh, most people really haven't thought, I think, a lot about that. But I, I think if one looks at not only what he says, but what he does in, in this respect, one sees uh, Ike's belief uh, uh, and his promotion of the, of the civil religion uh, in more as, as much in what he does as, as, as what he says. Uh, well, uh, at this point, I, I want to get on to the uh, talking about the pandemic, the flu epidemic of, of, of uh, 1918. Uh, my remarks in this respect are taken from an article I wrote for History News Network in May of, of 2021 called The Second Battle of Gettysburg, Eisenhower's Fight with the 1918 Flu Pandemic. Uh, but it also has a, a, a short a section in my book on uh, the religious journey of Dwight D. Eisenhower as, as well. Uh, uh, Ike was a graduate of the class of 1915. This is the class that the stars fell on. Uh, 59 generals came out of that class of, of 164 people, 64 cadets. And he volunteered to go to the Philippines, but was sent to Texas and Fort Sam Houston instead, where he met and subsequently married Mamie. And soon his son, Dow Dwight, was born, Little Ike, who was also nicknamed Ikey. Following the United States involvement in World War I, Eisenhower e eagerly sought a combat assignment, but instead he received training assignments, I suspect because he was such a superb trainer and coach. He eventually ended up in Fort Meade training and outfitting the 301st Tank Battalion for Europe with hopes of going to Europe in command. But when the 301st was deployed to Europe, Ike was instead assigned to Camp Colt in command of the U.S. Tank Corps training center in Gettysburg. Profoundly disappointed that he wasn't going to go lead the tank corps in combat. But he was too valuable for combat, said his commander, Colonel Wellington. The story of Ike's command at Camp Cold is remarkable. Uh, 
even even without the story of the pandemic of 1918, it was remarkable. He was a strict disciplinarian. He believed that morale was built by setting the highest standards and then helping his officers and men achieve them. And I commend you, uh, commend to you a, a number of really good stories from Camp Cole that, that uh, underscore this. And only want to suggest here that his suggest in dealing with the pandemic at Camp Cole in part was built upon a foundation of conscientiousness and respect that he had established in a very short time, five months uh, after arriving in Gettysburg. Uh, good accounts of the Camp Colt experience can be found in, in, in Gene Edward Smith's Eisenhower and Peace and War and Carlo Dest's Eisenhower, A Soldier's Life. I think these are the two best accounts of Eisenhower at Gettysburg. So for the moment, I want to leave Ike standing with his hands in his pockets, perhaps surveying Camp Colt while he enjoys a good summer of 1918. He was three years out of West Point. He was 27 years old. He had a young wife and a baby with a command of a thousand troops, which would quickly grow to 10,600 raw volunteers plus 600 officers. He'll soon be promoted to major, temporary, and eventually to the lieutenant colonel, and one of the youngest colonels in the army. But for millennia, and we're gonna take now a backward look at the uh, movement of the pandemic towards the camp. For millennia, hundreds and thousands of ducks and the geese and shorebirds and cranes darkened the skies over western Kansas during their migrations along the central flyway from Canada and the Gulf of Mexico. And this great migration that ha ha happens annually also rained down billions of bird viruses on Kansas farms and fields and watering holes and pig walls. Evidently, sometime during the 1917 fall migration, the mutating bird virus infected pigs who in turn sickened Kansas farmers. In early February, 1918, the county physician West Dodge City noted an increase in influenza cases of a unusually a virulent nature. The doctor's patients were struck down quickly and often recovered within three days. Soon doctors in Western Kansas around Dodge City were swamped with seriously sick flu patients with surprising su sudden deaths among otherwise healthy young adults. Then as quickly as the influenza storm began in March, the epidemic in Western Kansas and schools and businesses, which had been temporarily closed, reopened, and life seemed to return to normal. 
well, some of these farmers and other young men in western Kansas were on their way to war. war. And in 1918, I think Kansans were more concerned about the war in Europe than they were about the flu, flu season at home. And some of these young men from Dodge, the Dodge City area arrived at Camp Funston at Fort Riley, where they received basic training for the Army. And apparently some of these young men arrived at the camp carrying the flu virus. On March 4th, the camp cook at Funston fell ill. And in the following three weeks, 1,100 soldiers were hospitalized with the flu and thousands of more sought relief in the infirmary and 38 died. Now, this number was high, but not high enough to cause great alarm. And thereafter, soldiers from Camp Funston, some infected with the influenza virus, were shipped to France, where they waited for a battlefield side assignment in crowded marshalling areas, which were rife with disease of all sorts. And these fresh troops from America were mixed with wounded, sick, and transient British troops. And the British troops headed, heading for the front were infected with the flu by the Camp Unstead Americans or whether they, whether they picked it up from a different strain of virus or both. The H1N1 virus then exploded on the British front and crossed easily to the German lines and rapidly felled soldiers up and down the line. And consequently, at the same time, the flu overran Spain and consequently, we talk about the Spanish flu, but probably as it spread throughout Europe, somewhat unfair to the Spanish, I suspect. In this wave, Millions were infected and suffered, but comparatively few died. And this was about to change. In 1918, flu epidemic waned the 1st of August. And then all hell broke loose. Somewhere, Somehow, the virus mutated into a killer. And by late August 1918, the second wave of flu hit widely scattered Atlantic ports in the North Atlantic from England and Norway to Boston. And of course, Boston was the gateway to Fort Devens, where 45,000 troops, combat veterans, and new recruits were assembled. And inevitably, inevitably on September the 8th, Fort Devens reported its first case. Shortly thereafter, a shipment of recruits from Fort Devons arrived at Camp Cole, with many of the men feeling achy. Well, because they'd all received the typhoid fever shot before embarking for Camp Cole, the doctors presumed they were going to feel better in the morning. By daybreak, however, hundreds of soldiers were ill. And within a week, about 27% of Camp Colt had become sick. When the virus struck, there were 10,600 men at Camp Colt. 
Now, again, numbers vary, but approximately 3,000 men, it is thought, became sick with the, uh, with the flu at this time. Well, you could imagine, I think, the situation. You could imagine the crisis. You could imagine that challenge that Eisenhower suddenly faced. I mean, here he is one day literally pushing his men with all of his might and persuasion in hard preparation to leading this camp, this tank corps into battle in France. And then literally overnight, he loses about a third of his command to sickness. And is battling now an unknown, unseen flu virus that is creating havoc at the camp. Ike is in command. He's 27 years old. But he has no, I mean, he, has, he doesn't have immediate support elsewhere except for himself. And the fate of Camp Cole is literally in this young officer's hands. What I intend to do in, in, in concluding my report this morning or the talk is to run down the 12 major decisions that Eisenhower made to cope with the 1918 pandemic, and, and then perhaps we can discuss them. The first decision he made, I think, was very crucial and very important, and to me quite interesting, he decided not to meddle with the medical staff, but he placed full confidence for all medical decisions into the hands of his chief surgeon, Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Scott, of the Oklahoma National Guard. Well, you might say, well, of course, but you know, we've lived through a pandemic where we know this isn't, of course. But Eisenhower authorized the doctors to employ all known remedies, remedies and procedures to curtail the epi epidemic. So some of that, what we're gonna hear next in terms of what he authorized, number two, you can see you can hear the voice of, of Dr. Thomas Scott in, in the background, I'm sure. Ike assumed that the entire camp had been exposed to the flu. And so he ordered setting up tents across the Get Gettysburg battlefield, assigning three men to a tent but limiting it absolutely to four. What did this mean? I, mean, I wished I had a picture. I wish we could get in, get in a, a, some kind of helicopter or go over side. But there were about 2,500 tents that bloomed on the Gettysburg battlefield almost overnight. I have no idea where, where he found all of these tents, but he did. Uh, it, 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 it itself seems to be is an extraordinary achievement. All troopers, thirdly, all troopers known to be exposed to the virus were isolated, all of them. And the most serious of them were housed in Xavier Hall, adjacent to the St. Francis Xavier Catholic Church on High Street. In addition to isolating the sick, Eisenhower quarantined the entire base, posting MPs around the entire per perimeter, preventing unauthorized departure from the camp or entrance into the camp. He shut the place down completely. Now, in addition to the isolation and to the quarantine, 
he directed that all personnel receive inoculations for smallpox and typhoid fever. Now he, now, he knew that these inoculations were not going to have any effect on the flu, but he decided, I suspect, what uh, the doctor's recommendation that they would l limit associated diseases. We're not going to deal with typhoid or smallpox in, in, the, in, the, in the middle of this flu pandemic. And so everyone who didn't get a shot got one for these two. Sixthly, and imagine, think about this for 10,000 plus soldiers, every soldier received a daily medical examination. Uh, he, he had more than 30 physicians, plus army nurses and orderlies to help in, in this respect. Seventh, Eisenhower decided to, to order that all tent flaps be open and that bedding be aired daily. Well, I hope you're getting a visual image of what's going on in this camp with the tents and the flaps open and the, the, the bedding being cleaned out and people lined up everywhere getting shots and get, getting examined. Uh, it, 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 it's an image that, 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 that's hard to conceive of, I think. And eight, and I think probably most difficult, is that they didn't have enough coffins. There were not enough coffins available and there was no immediate burial ground. And so the dead were dispatched to a storage tent that became a makeshift morgue, but they were removed and isolated as well. Ninth, I ordered that the orderlies orderlies swab all the floors in the camp daily with sterilizers and kerosene. Uh, and 10th, at Scott's recommendation, Eisenhower authorized the use of experimental treatments in the camp including treatments for his headquarters staff and his family. And of Scott's experimental treatments and medications, Ike noted, and this is the quoting Ike, each morning the doctors would use two sprays on the throat and nostrils. One of them was intensely pungent and strong. Uh, on application, I felt as if the top of my head was going to be blown off. The second, I think of, uh, this is not Ike, the second was, was yeah, I think, intended to be a, a buffer uh, to relieve the first. And the doctors insisted in treating Eisenhower's staff and family and as many soldiers as they could twice a day with this now, did this do any good? Uh, I don't know. But apparently they were fortunate because no one on Ike's immediate staff or family contacted the flu. Eleven, Eisenhower authorized the doctors to treat civilians in Gettysburg as well as to cooperate with the local hospitals, churches, and local authorities of the town. So he didn't just isolate this uh, with respect to the army, but he looked at all of Adams County and Gettysburg as, as a, a matter of his concern. I don't know whether he was moved by common sense. I, don't, I can't tell you whether he was moved by compassion it may have been public relations, uh, you know, but he understood that given limited resources, both for the military 
and for civilians. It was best that the civilians and the military coordinate their efforts to, to, to combat this epidemic, coordinate their efforts as closely as possible. Uh, and finally, and importantly, I think, this is a number 12, Eisenhower sent clear situational reports to headquarters de detailing his actions, explaining what he was doing and, and why. Well, for the second time in less than 60 years, Gettysburg College, local school and church buildings, and other places were converted to hospitals to care for the stricken and the deathly ill. This, I think, was Eisenhower's Gettysburg battle. Fortunately, the crisis passed almost as quickly as it had arrived. Unlike our current experience, within two to three weeks, the dying at Cap Camp Colt ended, and with it, the influenza scare passed, leaving in its wake a shaken Eisenhower. Before the epidemic ran its course in November, the 1918 influenza panic killed almost as many American soldiers, and they killed about 52,000 has died in the battle in World War I, which is about 53,400. Camp Colt's success and Eisenhower's success in fighting the flu epidemic, I think, did not go unnoticed by the wartime department. When the crisis in Gettysburg ended, the War Department transferred 30 of Eisenhower's doctors from Camp Colt to provide instruction for the other Army posts on exactly how Eisenhower's command had coped with the epidemic. He became a, the model that the Army adopted. Although he was notable, noticeably successful in flighting the flu, never again would Eisenhower lose as many men under his command as he did during that ghastly fall in Gettysburg. Thereafter, after he had been reduced to his permanent rank as major, Eisenhower was awarded the Distinguished Service Medal for meritorious service at Camp Cold. This medal was the Army's highest peacetime decoration, usually given to generals and colonels, but not to those who served temporarily as lieutenant colonels. But Eisenhower was singular in this. And I, and I believe that it was, among other things, it was this, yes, in recognition of his uh, really brilliant leadership of the camp before the pandemic, but had there been failure to combat the flu count, pandemic successfully at Gettysburg, I really don't believe he'd have gotten this medal. Well, that's what I have to say, and we're open for, qu for questions and discussions about this matter. Uh, thank you so much. If you have questions, uh, you can type them in the chat. Um, if you prefer to unmute and ask your questions, please speak clearly, um, and you can do that. You can do so at this time.
while they're getting their questions together, um, of course, we, we know that there's always controversy about how, how things are handled, right? Everyone believes their leadership is a little different. Um, but do you consider Eisenhower's leadership um, during, during uh, the flu pandemic comparable to leadership during the current pandemic? Yeah, would you repeat the question? I, I said, uh, do you consider Eisenhower's leadership during the flu pandemic comparable to ah. the, the leadership of the current pandemic? Well, obviously I don't. <laughs> um, uh, when I published, had this published in 2000, May a, a year ago, uh, of 2021, I did uh, have on my mind that uh, uh, I thought what Eisenhower was doing in Camp Colt were lessons not learned uh, for uh, for combating a pandemic. Now, you know, whether or not that the, the situations are really medically comparable, I, I'm not qualified to say. But I was impressed with uh, with what he did and the action he took and uh, the, the, the success of uh, uh, relatively success. He did he did lose 175 men, uh, which was significant, no doubt about that. Okay, we do have a question in the chat. It says, "How did?" Sorry. How did the losses at Camp Colt compare to the losses of other camps in the United States? You know, it, it was about the same. Uh, uh, the losses uh, varied between about 8% to 1%. And I think Camp Colt's losses were about 2.5%. Uh, or maybe three. It's, it's, it's hard to get the figures because of, of the, uh, the, st the statistics are, are not solid and the populations are, are shifting all the time, given the fact that it's, it's a war situation. Okay, so uh, one of the things uh, that Ike or uh, Eisenhower did was that, uh, or that we've heard about, is that he um, always trusted his people uh, to honestly to do their jobs and, re and relied on their expertise and their professionalism. Um, do you think that that helped him as far as 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 what what he was able to do in the pandemic? Is that he trusted his people? Well, I, yes, and I, you know, one of the things that I think I said at the beginning, and then I, I implied, I mean, first of all, he did give the medical staff uh, basically authority to make the medical decisions. And so far as I can see, it didn't meddle in that at all. When it came to uh, marshalling, uh, getting the tents, uh, getting the cooperation with the Gettysburg people, finding room uh, for the sick and, and uh, outside the camp area, uh, getting supplies and food and the other things, that, logistical things that have to be done in terms of running the camp yeah, yeah, to keep it going. Um, you know, Eisenhower didn't do all that himself. Uh, so the fact that uh, the camp survived basically without uh, major food shortages or, or any, uh, so far as we know, any violence or, or panicking or anything, you know, is, is due, due to the, uh, the discipline and the uh, confidence and the respect that he managed to uh, establish prior to the camp being hit by this awful, uh, 
awful, awful a catastrophe. So yes, I think it, 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 you can view this as a, as a good example of uh, his, the success of his leadership, which is accomplished by delegating authority and responsibility. So he had 200 officers assigned to him that were responsible for carrying out these orders. Okay, before we get to the next question in the chat, is there anyone who, who would like to unmute and ask a question? I don't see any hands raised, but I wanna give you the opportunity. Go ahead, uh, Tom, unmute. You're muted, Tom, you'll have to unmute. I've got one in the chat. You want me to read it or do you see it there? Uh, is it the one about the book? Yeah. Yes, I will, I will. I will read that one. Okay, thank you. Okay, so his question is, what is the name of the book regarding Ike's religious journey? The name of the book? Yes, sir. Okay, the title of the book is The Religious Journey of Dwight D. Eisen, no, no, it isn't. It's Dwight David Eisenhower's <laughs> religious journey. Excuse me. Dwight David Eisenhower's religious journey. And it's published by Erdman's publishing company. All right. Any other questions? We don't have any other in the, any other questions in the chat. Anyone have a question that they'd like to unmute? Going once, going twice. Speak now, forever hold your peace. All right, well, we wanna thank you for, uh, for joining us. We do have a few questions, or I'm sorry, a few uh, announcements to wrap up. So if you'll bear with us for just a second. Um, let me... I want to say thank you so much to, to Dr. Hall. I really appreciate you uh, stepping in and, and doing this presentation and that we thought was appropriate for our ongoing theme of leadership. Hopefully everyone can see my screen. Oh, there you go. All right, so a few announcements. Our, our 2022 public programs are made possible by the Eisenhower Foundation and the Jeff Coat Memorial Foundation. We are certainly appreciate, appreciative to those two organizations. Uh, please join us next week, June 1st through the 3rd for our second annual World War II Emerging Scholars Symposium. We do have uh, four great speakers this year. Uh, you can find the information on our Facebook page, on our website. Uh, this is a, a partnership between us, the Roosevelt, and the uh, Truman Presidential Libraries. Uh, you can watch it on YouTube, and we are absolutely excited about this program. So please join us next week. It is virtual, um, just as, as the year before. Uh, this year, we have the return of our Symphony at Sunset on June 4th here in Abilene. So if you are local or nearby, please join us. Of course, this is a free concert. Our next program is the Evenings at Ease, which is on June 4th, where we'll welcome Michael Knapp from the American Battle Monuments Commission. And he will talk about Eisenhower and Pershing, uh, who was a mentor to Eisenhower. So please join us. That's at 7.15 on, oh, I'm sorry, at 7 p.m. on June 14th. Then our Lunch and Learn, our next Lunch and Learn, I cannot speak today. I am sorry. Our next Lunch and Learn will be Thursday, June 23rd, 23rd at noon, where we will welcome Major Evan Purpuris. Uh, he is uh, stationed at Fort Riley, and he will talk about his um, his ascent into leadership it, within the military. All right, and that is it. If you um, thank you for joining us, 
uh, I don't see any more questions. No one else, nothing else popped up. So thank you all for joining us and have a wonderful afternoon.